We adopted the freestall system back in the 1980s, early 1990s. Animal welfare in a freestall means a cow lying down. Today, we reach 40,000 liters of milk per hectare thanks to all these technologies, including fertilization and irrigation. We are the pioneering farm in the production of fresh, type A, A2 milk in Brazil. Here, we carry out three feedings per day. All the forage is produced on the farm, including both corn silage and a secondary forage source. Jesse sent a message saying that he won't be making videos anymore because you haven't subscribed to the Santa Fe channel. So subscribe now, and he will continue recording on farms around the world. Welcome everyone to the Santa Fe channel. Today I'm here with Roberto, director at Agrindus. We recorded an amazing video here at the farm. We showed the entire production system, the agriculture section, and the dairy plant. I really hope you enjoy this video. Leave your comments, give it a like, subscribe to our channel, and share it with others who are passionate about dairy cows and milk. Enjoy the video. And many thanks to Santa Fe for being with us today. My name is Roberto Yank. We are here at Agrindus. Agrindus is an 80-year-old company founded in 1945, now in 2025. We have been producing milk for 80 years here in Descalvado, Sao Paulo State. The farm began with an agro-industrial integration model and it has evolved from there. First with a cassinate factory, then with a cheese factory. In the 1970s, we began producing type B milk, which became the first deregulated price product in the Brazilian market. In the 1990s, we moved into type A milk. We are the pioneering farm in the production of fresh type A, A2 milk in Brazil. We helped develop the regulation and functional claim for A2 milk with ANVISA. We adopted the freestall system in the 80s, early 90s. The farm originally operated on pasture with supplementation. We made the switch to increase productivity per hectare, intensifying production. We began producing feed through intensive agriculture, increasingly so now with central pivot irrigation. So the main investment in recent years has been in agriculture and irrigation. And having a free stall system allows us to collect all effluents. We are able to separate solids, compost them, and fertilize the fields with the liquid fraction of the effluent. This results in a very interesting increase in agricultural productivity. Although freestall had once been perceived as an industrial system incompatible with environmental concerns, today it may be one of the most environmentally friendly options, as it enables full effluent collection and nutrient recycling. What was once considered a pollutant now becomes part of a virtuous nutrient cycle in agriculture. On the other hand, the freestall system is also ideal for high-producing cows as we can offer semi-climate control, sprinklers, fans, shade, bedding, easy access to feed, and 24-hour access to feed and water near the milking parlor. All this makes free stall an excellent option, especially in hot climates, such as our tropical environment. The system became more intensive, and we began increasing productivity per hectare. Back in the 1970s, we produced about 3,500 to 4,000 liters per hectare. Today, we reach 40,000 liters of milk per hectare using technologies like fertilization and irrigation. All this has led to greater revenue per hectare, which lowers the farm's financial risk. Even if we work with low margins per liter, the margin per hectare remains high, especially when compared to other crops like soybeans, corn, or sugarcane. This is how we remain competitive producing milk on high-value land in central Sao Paulo State. Animal welfare is one of our certifications. Today, we hold seven third-party certifications for our products. We were innovators in communicating these certifications to the consumer through a third-party seal on the packaging. That's how we reach the consumer at the moment they are alone in front of the shelf, having to decide which product to buy. We must communicate clearly. In a free stall, animal welfare means a cow lying down. A cow lying on clean bedding is the clearest sign of comfort because cows are ruminants that spend more than 12 hours a day lying down to chew cud. More aggressive cows spend about three hours per day eating, while the less aggressive ones may eat for up to six hours. After feeding, they lie down to ruminate. So when visiting a free stall, the best way to evaluate the facility is to observe cow behavior. They should either be eating or lying down, ruminating. That is their natural behavior, 
and lying down is the clearest indicator of comfort in a freestall system. This building we are in is an open freestall. The original freestall was designed for cold climates. In the 90s, facilities began to be adapted for hot climates. So this structure has a high roof, a steep roof pitch, and a central ridge opening to allow hot air to escape, known as the chimney effect. It has high ceilings, optimized bedding dimensions, space per cow, and feeding alley space. That's the design concept behind the open freestall. Now we're heading to a closed freestall designed as a wind tunnel. In this system, air enters at a low velocity through an inlet, passes through a water curtain to cool the air, and is then accelerated by exhaust fans. The building is fully closed. Air enters only through evaporative cooling pads and exits only through the fans. This creates a cooler environment with humidity entering with the air and enhanced thermal comfort due to wind speed inside the barn. Curtains reduce the building's cross-section, forcing air to speed up, which further improves comfort for the cows. In this system, the cows do not get wet, but we can feel the improved air movement, the breeze, and the thermal sensation, with the added benefit that cows remain dry. However, one drawback is that in tropical climates, the air already contains a lot of humidity, and when we introduce even more moisture, the environment may become overly saturated. According to the THI Temperature and Humidity Index used to assess cow comfort, humidity is just as detrimental as heat. That's why wind speed is so critical in a system like this. The higher the wind speed, the greater the thermal comfort. However, we must not exceed eight meters per second because at that speed, the air pressure can become so high that airflow to the cow's nostrils is reduced, impairing respiration. That's why it's important to have the entire system properly designed by a technical expert to ensure optimal thermal comfort. We don't use headlocks. We always use two rows of beds per barn, and we don't install a third row of beds as that would compromise the number of cows at the feeding alley. For us, comfort at the feed bunk is crucial, and we ensure one bed per cow, a one-to-one -one ratio in barn occupancy. We have a general manager who is highly specialized in people management, and we also have consultants in this area. We are constantly adapting, especially now, to meet the expectations of the new generation of employees who have different demands compared to older workers. Since we are a very traditional farm, until recently, everyone working in the milking area was born on the farm, so we had very low turnover and a team of high trust. Now with younger people gaining access to mobile phones, motorcycles, cars, and life in the city, their level of commitment is different. So we are adapting to that, for example, by offering more time off, creating more flexible schedules during the week for this younger generation that wants free time and the ability to go into town. So there has been a reduction in working hours and an increase in time off. This results in lower labor efficiency and requires more people on staff. However, on the other hand, we are able to meet the expectations of this new workforce, young people whom we want to retain within the company even though they are much more demanding than previous generations. Here on the farm, regarding genetics in the herd, our entire herd is purebred Holstein, and today we perform genomic testing on 100% of the animals. All cows are A2A2 and wear an A2 certification ear tag. Sometimes a cow has a red tag. That means she cannot be inseminated here on the farm. She must serve as a recipient for an embryo. This indicates that she has lower genetic value based on the genomic test. The red tag is a sign that we don't want her to contribute genetically to the next generation. Instead, we want her to give birth to an offspring that is genetically superior, using a bull that is also superior to what we would have otherwise chosen for her. That's how we ensure genetic advancement in the herd. Regarding conception, we use a system where we have an in vitro fertilization lab on the farm. We routinely follow ET protocols, embryo transfer, implanting embryos, or use artificial insemination, depending on the genetic evaluation of each animal. At birth, all heifers are evaluated, and we identify which ones will be the future mothers of the herd. The top 10% of heifers are temporarily selected to become embryo donors. Each one donates twice before her first insemination and twice again after her first conception. After that, she resumes her normal life we don't want to compromise her productivity by keeping her as a permanent donor. 
The group of donors is dynamic, constantly changing. We follow protocols using these embryos, and we achieve about 45% conception rates, especially with embryos. We are able to implant the embryo on the sixth day after estrus, which allows us to confirm the presence of a corpus luteum, a key indicator for us. This technique has improved over the past few years, especially with the advancement in sexed semen quality and our ability to match bulls with specific cows. We learned that certain sires and specific cow lines yield better results in embryo production. We have also moved away from using cows as donors, focusing instead on heifers, since the best genetics are usually found in younger animals, if the breeding program is done correctly. So we have stopped using cows as donors, and we are now achieving greater efficiency in embryo production from heifers. This is significant because heifers, from a technical standpoint, generally produce fewer embryos than cows. But we are working to improve that and increase embryo yields, which in turn improves results. In terms of sires, we use sexed semen for both heifers and first lactation cows. However, during the worst time of year, late summer, when cows are still suffering from heat stress, we sometimes switch to conventional semen to reduce costs. Sex semen is significantly more expensive, so we need a higher conception rate to justify its use. What have we been thinking about? Since we've been producing type A milk since the 90s, we already had robust traceability systems in place. That allowed us to implement milk segregation, which led us to A2 milk. When the A2 patent expired in 2015, we saw a great opportunity. We studied the topic and tested all our cows. So for several years, we were able to segregate A2 milk and process it in our own plant. Today, 100% of the herd is A2. This distinction is quite significant because not every dairy plant can do this. Most lack control over product origin. It will take time for the dairy industry as a whole to gain that kind of capability. We differentiate our product with a clean label, local production for local consumption, low carbon footprint, fresh and minimally processed milk. We also pioneered the use of transparent packaging. That was a decision made by my daughters, who run the Latino operation in brand. They introduced the idea of total transparency, from process to packaging. We bring people to the farm, host field days with influencers, mothers, nutritionists, pediatricians, and other groups. We show the entire process and demonstrate the traceability we've built into every step, from seed planting for feed production to the final package product. This whole concept reflects something I find very relevant, what Americans call local produced for local families. From an environmental standpoint, it's a powerful idea because if you produce something in one place and ship it elsewhere, for example, Brazilian soy being exported to feed pigs and chickens in China, the carbon footprint of that ingredient is enormous. But if we can produce the feed on our farm, use byproducts from the local food industry, make a fresh, minimally processed product and deliver it locally, we're already doing that quite well being strategically located in central Sao Paulo state. We have 48 million consumers around us. That makes a huge difference in the carbon footprint of the final product and allows us to deliver a truly differentiated offering. It's a two type A milk with extremely low bacterial counts under both European and American regulations, which are aligned with the Brazilian type A milk standards. This gives us a highly differentiated product with an ultra low carbon footprint. In my view, that has much more impact than organic milk. Organic milk is positioned as free from pesticides and so on, but it's produced in small quantities and is often inefficient in terms of using humanity's finite resources, such as water and land. It must also be transported to major cities where the higher income consumers live. People often ask me, what do you think about organic? Honestly, I think it's an elitist product. It's not accessible to the majority of consumers it's an alternative, yes, but not the solution to the current global challenge. A growing population in finite land and water. We must learn to use these finite resources more wisely with a lower carbon footprint and less environmental impact while still producing enough food for everyone. We also have other operations here at the company. In the 60s and 70s, the farm was 100% dairy. Then in the 80s, we introduced beef cattle production. Today, we raise F1 calves in Mato Grosso do Sul and also operate feedlot finishing here at the farm. 
It's a segment that has grown over time. Beef production complements our other line, citrus farming. And why do we work with both dairy and citrus? Because milk is a dollar-based cost product sold in reyes on the domestic market. Citrus is the opposite. The main costs are in reyes, mainly harvesting and freight, but we sell in dollars. Both are highly intensive per hectare in terms of revenue. Together, they act as a currency hedge because we believe that one of the biggest risks in Brazilian agriculture is the exchange rate. We can shift from inefficiency to extreme efficiency with a single move from the market. For example, through a significant exchange rate fluctuation. Beef cattle production is particularly relevant in this context because oranges and milk are among the most perishable products in the market. These are goods over which we essentially don't have full control. They must be produced and delivered immediately due to their short shelf life. By contrast, beef cattle represents a store of value, a product that allows greater control over the timing of sale. This combination of three activities, dairy, citrus, and beef, offers us a strong buffer against macroeconomic risks, which are beyond our control and lie outside the farm gate.